Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Matt Hall. I'm the science supervisor. Thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity tonight to, to come here and give you an update on uh, the science department, our science program, and the work we've been doing. We've been uh, involved in quite a lot of transitional work over the past five or six years. And uh, <clears throat> sort of looking out at our board, we have some faces that have been part of, of sort of hearing about the progress work, and we have some new faces. So I thought it might be helpful to uh, start with a little historical context um, to prime the work that we've been engaged in, and then um, where we're headed next. So that's really sort of the layout here. So I want to start... Um, not all the way back. We're not going to go all the way back to Thomas Jefferson and, and that sort of thing, but back to the Reagan era um, when the National Commission on Excellence in Education released a landmark report called A Nation at Risk. And really what this was, was a call to action to Congress um, about America's education system and really uh, rang the alarm bells that uh, we may be falling behind in terms of international competition. Um, and a focus of this was uh, science and math. You know, the, the fields that today we call STEM um, really became a focus because those areas are really important. Scientific innovation, um, engineering, mathematics really are important for the economic health of the nation. So th this was a report that um, if you're a student of history and educational history, it was somewhat controversial, but it really did um, get a lot of things going, right? So NCTM, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics was established, started to establish frameworks for what should be taught in regards to mathematics in schools. The American Association for the Advancement of Science um, initiated a, what they called Project 2061. And it was by the year 2061, this is what science education should look like in the United States. And they established for the first time benchmarks for scientific literacy, okay? This was in the 90s. The National Research Council developed the National Science Education Standards. So this was really a kickoff for the standards reform movement in the United States. So at the time in 1983, New Jersey did not have content standards, okay? It wasn't until 1996 that New Jersey adopted content standards for all of the core curriculum areas, and they called them the core curriculum content standards. Uh, sort of a logical name, go uh, New Jersey Department of Education. Um, and what that did was it defined what should be taught in public schools, and public schools are responsible for delivering those content standards. Science was among the standards that were developed and adopted in 1996. And with this sort of reform mindset in the country, there was a lot of focus and there was a lot of information, a lot of depth, uh, or not depth, but a lot of breadth to the science. This is, for many of us, the type of science education system that we came up when we were in high school, right? And it has been described, often described, as that mile wide, inch deep, um, a lot of content um, type of program. So those standards served New Jersey well for many years, um, and they continue to refine um, and revise and readopt um, content standards on about an every five year cycle. Uh, and then we'll fast forward to 2010 um, when New Jersey adopted for the first time a national set of standards um, rather than a New Jersey specific set of standards. And that was the Common Core Standards in English Language Arts and Mathematics. And not long after that, the Next Generation Science Standards as a set of national science education standards. Now, this was a seismic event for science education in the United States and within New Jersey, okay? Um, they were adopted or, or renamed 
in 2016, the New Jersey Student Learning Standards for Science. Uh, and if you were to compare that set of standards to the next generation science standards, the only thing you would really find different is the logo at the top of the page. They were pretty much exactly the same. Um, in 2020, they were readopted with minimal changes for high school. So we are in that era of next generation science standards and the next generation science standards are quite different than earlier standards, that mile wide inch deep. So how are they different? So the New Jersey, or <clears throat> the next generation science standards, New Jersey um, student learning standards for science are really about the nature of science as is practiced and experienced in the real world. world. So practice, scientific practice is a big part of that. Scientific practices had been in earlier standards, but often they were taught as more content. Um, and you may remember from your own experiences, things like remembering the steps of the scientific method. The scientific method was a list of things, uh, of steps to be remembered, more so than a skill set to engage in, okay? And so the NGSS sort of challenges that. They're developed around student performance expectations. So not just what does the student know and what can they answer on a test, but what can they apply to new or novel problems. Um, there's, they were designed to have a coherent progression from preschool all the way up through 12th grade, um, which were based on learning progressions that were age level appropriate. And that was something that was, um, that folks were sort of critical about earlier standards. You know, sometimes students would be introduced to concepts at an early age like electricity, um, like in fourth grade before they understood the structure of an atom and electrons and things like that. And it was, it's really a focus on a deeper level of understanding of a narrower focus of content as well as the application of that content. So a narrowing of that mile wide idea and a, a depth of knowledge. Also of note, engineering standards are integrated throughout and that was a new, a new thing. So not just science and science as a theoretical body of knowledge to be learned, but also to apply, apply to solve problems uh, and develop solutions. And of course, um, I think we've all heard many times um, the need to prepare students for college, career, and citizenship. Okay? The other thing is there was now better alignment between science and other content areas, in particular um, English language arts and mathematics. So there was, there was a lot of integration there, and, which is good. So to be clear, the next generation science standards are predicated on the belief that the purpose of science instruction and science education is to empower students to make sense of natural phenomena and to solve novel problems using scientific knowledge and principles. And, and, and I share this because this is what, as a public school in New Jersey, when we think about what are we trying to accomplish with our science education, our science instructional program, this is the outcome. This is the purpose, to empower students to make sense of natural phenomena and to solve problems. So it's a student-based problem solving, it's an application focus, okay? So then what does that look like here at, at Hutterd and Central. So since 2016, we have been changing the way we do our science instructional program. And there have been a lot of changes. So we, are, we have developed a more team-based, um, collaborative, what we call a professional learning community approach to our department. So our department is organized into teams and the teams are tasked with um, with, with solving instructional problems collaboratively. So not individually, um, not as little independent islands to one another, but as a team to deliver 
a consistent experience. Uh, we had to align our program to the NGSS. Um, it was not beforehand. And when I say program, I mean every aspect of it, the curriculum, the course sequence, the instructional strategies, none of that was NGSS aligned. So we've been doing a lot of work. There's been a lot of professional learning, um, discussion, um, adaptation of um, instructional materials, uh, pretty much a soup to nuts uh, revision of our program. We didn't revise our curriculum. We created new curricula from scratch. Um, we also noticed that um, our science courses, specifically our environmental science, our biology, our chemistry, and our physics courses, were all pretty much separated from one another. There wasn't a coherence. Uh, there weren't through lines in that experience. So um, that is something when we were designing and redesigning curricula to have more consistency or coherence across grade levels as well as consistency in, in our levels. So in other words, the experience, the philosophy behind the honors ninth grade science course should be similar to the 10th grade and the 11th grade. It all makes sense, but it wasn't in place. So there, there was work to be done there. Uh, and a lot of great conversations about what do those levels even mean? What, it, what is the student that we're developing these courses for? Um, what do we want that experience to be like for them? Um, consistency is one of those things that, um, that you're gonna see as a, a theme here. And I, and I know that Dr. Moore has spoken about that on, on many different occasions. And you probably hear that from the other supervisors when they come here too. But making sure that there's a consistent experience for students across sections of the same course um, and when we say consistency, we're talking about consistency in homework expectations and the amount of homework, the types of things they do, grading, assessment, all of those things are similar, right? And the magic is really when we have a consistency of experience, there are, there's collaboration within the PLC, um, but we're not handing a script to our teachers and saying, we want you to be a robot and follow the script. You know, we, we, we do our best to hire the best professionals we have, and we want to take advantage of that, that expertise. Um, so that's, that's really, um, I, I feel like we're in a good place with that now, but that, there was a lot of work to get there. Um, <clears throat> honors and AP level courses, uh, we've been working to increase access to those courses. And by access, I mean, um, there were all sorts of prerequisites and um, sp very specific pathways that students would have to um, attend to in terms of what courses am I gonna take in what sequence to get to our upper level um, courses. And we have really been working to streamline those. Um, and for every one of those gates that we put in front of a student to be really, um, to interrogate them, right? Is this really a wall that we should be putting up? Is it necessary to the success of that student? And, and is there a way that we can, we can do this in a different way? And uh, one example is our AP environmental science course, which is now a choice for ninth graders. Um, that was one of those courses that prior to this work, Students needed to take at least honors biology and honors chemistry to, to take AP environmental science. So they were juniors. We now have ninth graders who are taking that course uh, and, and really just blowing it out of the water. The, it, it's amazing what they're doing in there. And, and when we compare their performance to other schools, high performing schools in the state, it, it's unbelievable. I have. I have supervisors from other schools calling me all the time saying, how are you doing this? And, and sometimes they don't even know that they're ninth graders, right? They're like, how is your average AP environmental science score 4.5 out of five? Um, and then when we say, yeah, by the way, 90% of those students are ninth graders. Um, that's about just being very, very um, 
critical about the obstacles that we're putting in front of students, the types of prerequisite knowledge that we're claiming that they need ahead of time. And a lot of that can be taught within the flow of the course. And, and, and so that's really been great. Um, five or six years ago, our AP science performance wasn't where we wanted it to be. And so we've been really working to improve that. Um, and it is, it, it is much improved. There are still some opportunities to, to improve it further. Um, and some of those are really running up against our access ideas. So, you know, that's the kind of thing we're looking at now. Um, our Biomedical Science Academy is new, and that's been an exciting and fun um, project to, to work on. Um, we're in the second year of it now. Uh, the students are doing great, and we're looking forward to year three and what that, that experience looks like for them next year. Um, many of these students um, are engaged in, in an, an, you know, right now they're, they're starting anatomy. Um, many of these students would have never taken our anatomy and physiology class, and yet they're in there, they're learning all the bones and muscles and the human body. It's really, it's really fun to see. Um, we've successfully adapted our instructional program throughout the ongoing public health emergency, right? That was a huge lift that we couldn't have done had we not established a lot of these other things, um, the PLC teams, um, these common ideas around um, teaching and learning and, and, and the collaboration. So that, that has been really um, a huge success. Okay, so I have been talking about our course sequence. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I wanted to touch on our course sequence um, as, a, as a, a look at what does our program look like, okay? So I mentioned before we are delivering the science standards, the next generation science standards. Those are really organized around the three disciplines. So you have your earth and space science, your biology, life science, and then physical science. So there are really three, um, three focuses of science and those sort of go along with the graduation requirements for the state. So when we design a science program, what we need to do is deliver the standards and, and make sure that that experience is accessible to all of our students, no matter what level or whether they're English language learners or they're special education students or they're in our Aspire program or, or, or what have you. All of our students need access to the full breadth of the standards. We also need to make sure that we are providing for them uh, a, a structure to achieve their, the, the graduation requirements in science. And the way those work is students need 15 credits, but they're specific credits, like clusters of credits. So one cluster of five credits has to be in either environmental science, chemistry, or physics, okay? A second cluster of five credits has to be in biology, life science. And the third cluster of credits has to be in another lab or inquiry-based science program that is aligned to the standards. So when we look at that, as ninth graders, all of our ninth graders take environmental and earth science. And what that does is that checks that first five credit box, the environmental chemistry or physics box. Our 10th graders all take biology. That's that second five credit requirement for biology. And then in 11th grade, our students really pick between chemistry or physics. Um, and most of them, frankly, take chemistry. Uh, I'm not sure why. I think that's the way it has always sort of been. But they have access to pick physics as well. And many of them actually take chemistry as 11th graders and then as 12th graders, they take physics. But by going through this sequence, they will 
hit all of those necessary credits to graduate while at the same time hitting the three main areas of science that the standards are organized around. So that's the, that's the underlying design. And I mention that because as board members, you probably look at our science program and you say, gee, that's a little bit different than I see up the road at North and Voorhees and at DelVal and South and all around. Because many schools, most schools, frankly, go biology, chemistry, and physics, high schools. And that satisfies the graduation requirement, but what it doesn't do is address a third of the standards, which are earth and space science. Okay, and so that's something that we're doing very intentionally. Uh, and the reason for that is because many of our, I don't know what the sister schools in, in, in other places, they're still delivering the science program from 1996, okay? That, that one from, that came out of that nation at risk era, okay? So we have sort of gone beyond that at this point. So this is our core science program. In addition to our core program, we have lots of electives, okay? So you'll see the ones with the little stethoscope next to them. Those are our biomedical academy electives. Um, you see we have a variety in 10th, starting in 10th grade, we have a variety of electives that address the earth and space sciences. Um, the reason they're placed there is because all of the students had taken their core foundational class as ninth graders. Starting in 11th grader or in 11th grade, we have more biology um, oriented electives opening up. Um, and then in 12th grade, we have a couple that are physical science in nature, aviation science and honors organic chemistry. So all, all together, um, we have a very robust science program, 11 core science courses, 13 electives, five different AP courses. We have three courses specifically designed to support our English language learners, and we have two um, for our Aspire students. Um, so when we look back at our mission as a district and we say all means all, our science program is designed to make sure we are providing opportunities and so core learning opportunities as well as elective opportunities for everyone. Okay, so a little snapshot at enrollment. Um, one of our goals is really, and the reason I, I share this is, one of our goals is we have different levels. We have a general level for students who need more support. We have a CP college preparatory level, which is a students college bound, and um, we want to make sure that they're they're college ready, that's the level. We have honors, it's more rigorous, it goes deeper, um, more enrichment built in, and we have AP. So our goal is to really sort of have an on-ramp to our science program for all of the ninth graders coming from our sending group or if they're coming from, you know, out of district or something like that, but also to sort of push them up and have them reach and sort of move up. So one of our goals is to see this, these percentages sort of creep up over time. So a couple numbers to look at here. If we look at honors, environmental, and earth science, 27% of our students, um, and this is this year's data, 27% of our students are taking that. Um, we have another 8% in um, AP environmental science. And then we have our CP level, 44%. And then you have um, some other sorts of things here too. The, if you see a one next to it, like that blue slice to the left, that's a, um, that's a special education replacement section. Um, the ones designated ELL um, are the, that was the English language learner section and that's really designed at the CP level. Um, and then that orange slice is our general 
and that's sitting at 12%. So as we look at biology and chemistry, what we hope to see is that the, the, you know, the higher levels, we see that the, the number begins to creep up. So we'll look at biology, and you can see that there's a greater percentage of students in honors biology than we saw in the earlier slide. Um, and it's really being pulled out of CP. So we're not seeing the general level push up the way we want. That's an area that we're looking at. Um, but you are seeing the CP level really push up into the honors and AP more so. Um, so that, that this is, I, I would say that's sort of a mixed, a mixed bag in terms of success. Um, chemistry, you can see um, it's a you know it, it's a similar trend, but that slice of orange there is is bigger than we want it to be, right? So that's a that's an area that we're looking at as well. Um, there are less slices of this pie. Um, we do not have this year uh, an ELL um, chemistry course. That's something that's in development for next year. Um, so, so you see that. Uh, and then physics. Physics is a little bit harder to interpret because we don't have a general level of physics. We start at CP. So um, I include that one just to be sort of as a completionist, but it's not really a, a, a good... Um, comparison. Okay. All right. So how do we deliver this? So let's look at the department by the number. So the science department consists of 30 teachers. Um, partnered with our teachers, we have eight special education co-teachers um, and two uh, ELL paraprofessionals, um, which really the, the special education co-teachers and the ELL paras, they really are a tremendous resource for our science department. They're fantastic. Um, and, you know, we, we just, we're, we're so grateful to have them um, supporting our program. In terms of certifications, certification in um, New Jersey is another one of those things that's an important variable to consider um, with your program. Because unlike English or math or social studies, where there's one certificate, in order to teach a specific science course at the secondary level, you have to hold a specific certificate. So we have, of our 30, half of our teachers are biology certified, okay? Um, we have five chemistry certified teachers. We have five earth science certified teachers, three physics, and we're very fortunate to have eight physical science certified teachers. So you're probably asking, what's the difference between physical science and physics? So a physical science certificated teacher can teach physics, chemistry, or earth science. An earth science teacher can teach earth and space science courses. A chemistry teacher can teach chemistry or environmental science. A biology teacher can teach biology or environmental science, and a physics teacher can teach physics or environmental science. So when you think back at our program, our ninth grade course is environmental and earth science, which means that all of our 30 certificates can teach that course. Then our, our 10th grade course our next most sort of enrolled is biology. And our biology teachers, when we recruit them, they're teaching biology, they're teaching biology electives, they're teaching our biomedical academy, and they're teaching our environmental and earth science courses. And our physical science, we're fortunate because those are the teachers that can sort of pivot between physics and chemistry. So, the, the takeaway from this chart is that we have a lot of flexibility in how we staff, okay? So, which means that, it, so when enrollment shifts 
or when we do our sectioning, we do our sectioning based on student requests and needs, not on saying, hey, we have three sections of this, so we're going to pick three sections worth of students to go there. We're able to flex our staff to cover those um, really no matter what happens. So that's, that's really a strength um, of, of how our distribution of certificates here. Okay, in terms of educational background, um, two thirds of our department has an advanced degree that, you know, they have a master's or, or a doctorate. Um, and many of the eight you see in bachelors are actively working on a master's degree right now. So um, it is a group of, of very, um, very dedicated, very smart, um, hardworking individuals. So um, really terrific. I mean, I, 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 I count myself very, very fortunate to be able to lead the team um, that we have here. Um, I've worked in, in some other places and I will say the Hunter and Central Science Department is the best. They're the best that I've worked with and thank you for your support as a board because um, I, it wouldn't be this way without your support. Okay, in terms of years in district, um, the average is about 10 years. So most of our, our, our science teachers have about 10 years of experience. You can look at some different ways of looking at central tendency there, but um, the takeaway from this is we really have two, we have a bimodal pattern here. We have 25% of our department is new, three quarters of the department is not, and we have, um, we have unfortunately quite a few of them that are heading towards that retirement side of the, the, uh, the, the chart here. So that's something that we're gonna need to, to watch. Um, and um, when I get to some of the challenges that we're facing, staffing is number one. That's our number one challenge. Okay, so priorities. So we talked about the mission of the science department. We talked about the composition of the science department. We talked about how we deliver our science program. So here we are, it's the 2021-22 school year and we have priorities. So we did a look back at what we've accomplished. Now, what are we, what are we looking at next? So first of all, uh, the pandemic has been a huge challenge, right? But we don't want that to interfere with us. We want to keep moving forward, um, not step back, not settle back into some of those um, old practices. And I know that's a theme here at Hutterd and Central. Um, and we're all very much dedicated to, to doing that. Leveraging the lessons learned um, from the last couple school years to move forward with flexibility uh, and to continue to, to you know, seek the, that vision that's in the strategic plan. Okay, another priority, safe return to experiential learning. Um, the NGSS is at its heart a constructivist design. Students learn through experience, right? That's at the heart of, of everything we do. And last year, we couldn't do a lot of that. Um, we couldn't do labs. We couldn't do um, a lot of the collaborative work. So this year, uh, that's a big focus for us. Um, we don't want to fall into habits of, um, you know, sort of isolated, independent, um, sort of old school, you know, book and worksheet kind of things. And so that's a, that's a challenge, frankly, um, and it's a focus for us. Um, we also want to return safe return to student to student collaboration. Uh, and of course, all the changing quarantine rules and stuff like that have been, um, you know, that's, that's stuff to navigate. Okay. <clears throat> Development and implementation of common benchmarks is a huge focus. And I'm going to get into assessment in just a, a moment in more depth um, to help you sort of understand the work that, that's happening there. But uh, you know, the needless to say, we're developing common benchmarks for all our science courses that are aligned to the NGSS. And that's, that's a key there. Um, we're also working 
to improve the staff proficiency in utilizing common assessment data. Okay. Um, frankly, most of, of our teachers are used to conducting assessment and looking at assessment in isolation and not comparing it with one another um, and learning from one another. And so that's a sort of a, a habit that's, that we're working to break. Uh, and we really want to particularly focus on utilizing collaborative data, common data, collaboratively to identify any disproportionalities that exist in the performance between various subgroups. Okay, and we're going to look at an example of that in just a moment. Okay, <clears throat> equity and inclusivity are a huge focus. Um, we tend to think of science as this pure uh, endeavor, a pure discipline that is um, sort of separate from, you know, the politics and, you know, it's very objective. There's no subjectivity and things like that. Um, but there, but that's, you know, th that's not the reality, right? There is, um, there is a perspective that we tend to look at things from. Um, and we want to make sure that the experience is relevant to the students who are learning it, right? So we need to make sure that uh, there's representation, um, that students can see science as something that's relevant to their own lives uh, and see themselves as potentially being scientists or engaging in scientific work. Um, and I won't go through all of these, but there's a lot of things that we're, we're focused on, um, a lot around relationship building, um, helping establish student self-efficacy um, and and really sort of analyzing whether or not that we have um, unintentional messaging within our uh, our curriculum um, one place that we've 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 been really um, having some great conversations is around um, talking about genetics right and when you talk about um, we tend to talk about mom here's the mother's um, genes and the dad's genes, and we're going to do a cross, and uh, maybe being a little more aware of the language being used, um, and, and and separating biological gender from identity um, when we talk about that. So challenges. Uh, so challenges to moving forward with our priorities. Staffing, I mentioned, is our number one priority. Uh, there, we, we have just had a, a terrible time finding folks, and it's not, that's not a phenomena that is, um, that is a hundred and central phenomena. It's, I'm hearing it all across the state. Um, I know it's a national issue. Um, I hear almost daily from colleagues in other districts who have open positions and can't find staff. Um, and we have really had a lot of challenges um, staffing, uh, and, and we, you know, we tend to have pretty stable staff, right? So I'm, even things like maternity leaves or medical leaves, we are just not getting applicants. And that's scary. Um, disruption stemming from the ongoing public health emergency. That is, of course, a challenge. Um, politicization of scientific and educational issues, right? That's a challenge. It's not a new challenge to science. Um, you know, I'm sure you're all aware that um, things like evolution, topics like evolution have been controversial, but it tended to be limited to sort of a fringe of, of folks. And now it's much more common um, for folks to have um, other, I guess, other than mainstream ideas about scientific topics and principles. Um, and I mentioned before assessment, lack of quality and GSS aligned assessment tools. We really don't have ready-made tools to go to. So what are we gonna do about that? So an example of that, uh, in the fall we did Start Strong. And we have not had um, a state science assessment in several years, and the last time we had it, it was really a pilot. So we don't have longitudinal data to compare it to, um, and we really don't, and, and frankly, the tools that we're seeing are not measuring what the NGSS is telling us we should be teaching. 
So I share the Start Strong assessment data as an example of that because we administer this test and this is the kind of stuff we get back, right? So all of the students, if you look at the top here, let's see if my laser reaches all the way over there. Maybe not. The top left is, that's our ninth grade Start Strong assessment data, which is intended to measure where the students were with regard to the, at the end of middle school. And we get three basically groups. We get green is less support, yellow is some support, and red is strong support, but not specifically what do they need support in. Um, 12th grade, we also administered it, and you could see, I guess, that it's a little bit better. There's more green. Um, but also, we're administering this to students who may not even be taking a science course right now. So, so, so there's really not a, a vehicle to provide support, even if we knew what it was. So this data, I mentioned, is sort of mostly useless. But there is something that comes out of this that is important and, and we need to know more about. And if you look at the, the graph in the bottom right-hand side, that's our demographic breakdown. And there's something in here that I just don't like to see. Um, and that is, if you look at the, the shape of the graph, red being strong support, orange being some support, green being less support. Um, if you look at the breakdown of the the demographics, the Asian and the, the white, you see the highest bar is green, the lowest bar is red. But when we look at our black and Hispanic bars, they're the opposite, right? That's, that's, you know, that's not great. That's alarming, right? That's something we want to look at and figure out why does it look like that? Um, so what are we going to do about that? So I mentioned we don't have good assessment data, but I also mentioned earlier that we're developing benchmarks. So what does that look like? And I skipped ahead. I forgot I put this in. This is an individual student report for Start Strong, which gives a little bit more data. Um, but this is not something that we get a report. We get PDFs to send to families, but we don't get a breakdown of this to even do anything, and it doesn't line up with the curriculum, the content standards. So it's, you know, it's sort of wonky. All right, but I wanted to get to what we are doing instead. So we are currently developing, because there really aren't any out there, NGSS aligned benchmarks for all of our core courses. And at this point, we have two developed for each of our core courses. And the way we did this was we developed blueprints for what needed to be taught, and we built the assessments off of that. And so this is an example of what that might look like for our environmental and earth science. We have our major curricular topic, the knowledge, comprehension, and application um, details, what standard it is, and the percent weight of, the, of this uh, topic on the assessment and the um, number of items. And so the teachers built these blueprints and then they went through and they further identified level of rigor um, in terms of Webb's depth and knowledge model um, and then the, the actual point weight of the test. And once this was all done, then questions started to be developed, okay? And the way we're doing this is those questions are being loaded into uh, the, Linkit, um, the Linkit platform. And then when we administer these tests, we can break the results down by all of these different components. What's the standard? What's the depth of knowledge level? Um, what's the particular topic? Um, and we can go through and really, in a very granular way, look at student performance. So at this point, we have administered our first benchmark, um, and we are going through and we're sort of, you know, doing a baseline setting. Um, we're looking for questions that may be problematic that we need to adjust. Uh, but it's really promising, and it's, 
it's sort of exciting to see. Here's sort of a snapshot of what that might look like, um, the kind of data that we can get with the platform. Um, so you see the top left is really just a, a distribution of all of the students together. It looks pretty much like you would expect. Um, for those of you who like statistics, it's a, a left skewed curve. You know, that's what you would sort of expect. Um, on the top right, you can see a breakdown by standard um, and it color codes it for us. And then the bottom um, is an item analysis. And so you can see things like that orange one that jumps out when you look at it. That's a question that way too many students got wrong. And so what we do then is we go back and we look at that item and we say, why did they get that wrong? Is it the wording? Um, is it something that the activity is not effective? Um, but it's really giving us a lot of actually useful data to work with. Okay, so we talked about some of our challenges. Uh, um, I, you know, I, I think I thought it would be nice to end on a positive. What are our advantages? We have a lot of assets um, with regard to the work we do. So first of all, the science department staff is committed to their students. They're absolutely committed to the students and the student experience. Um, that is not a problem for us. Um, I, I have to say thank you to the board uh, and thank you to the administration for the support. Um, it, it is, it's phenomenal and it, you know, the support that you provide us um, as a department and as a school um, is directly related to how we have accomplished as much as we have. Uh, so, so thank you. Um, you know, we could not have done this without that support. Um, our community values science education, right? This is a community that knows that, um, you know, we have many, many folks who are, have, who work in scientific fields, uh, technical fields, things like that. It's valued. Um, it's not a, you know, we, we don't have problems recruiting students to take science classes. Um, and that's, that's great. So, um, I'm, you know, I'm very grateful to the support we get from the community. And STEM careers are attractive to many students. So that's, that's an asset that, um, that we enjoy for sure. 